All right. How's Gurgaon going for everyone? Are you guys having a good time? Man, I love this event. They do such a good job. So thank you guys, volunteers, organizers, kicktails. So this, uh, this talk is on everything we got wrong, right? And I, it should be on everything we got wrong. That's what the abstract says. I started to put together the talk and realized I had like a workshop material. I'm like, oh, we get too many things wrong. So this is 50 minutes of most of what we get wrong. Those things we say all the time that sound really good, we're like, this is how we're going to secure things that really lead us to make bad decisions. Um, my name is Wolf Gorlick. A couple things about me. So my sec, hang out with my sec, the open uh, community, right, that Lansing and Southfield and, and um, what am I thinking, Jackson, right there out there, if you guys want to hang out. I'm there all the time. Uh, MIC3, the Michigan Cyber Civilian Corps, the volunteer firefighting team, I'm part of that. So shout out to them. I work with CBI, where I'm the vice president of strategy. Uh, working with very senior leaders to define strategy as well as running our talent development program. So I work with very, very junior folks right, right into the field. Uh, MVP and proud contributor of OWASP for uh, web application security. So that's me. That's my logos. Um, the thing about this talk, I want to dedicate it to Cthulhu. Yeah. Right? Am I right? The Lovecraft... The Lovecraft theme was brilliant. So again, thank you, Gurkhan. I love Gurkhan. So with that, um, let's first talk about Arkham. First thing that comes to mind when you guys hear Arkham, right, is like probably Batman, right? Arkham, Arkham Asylum, and the game and everything. And that's where our mind goes. But, but if you think about like Lovecraft, Arkham was really one of his cities, right? It was a fictional city. Historically, Arkham... Uh, was a place that uh, Lovecraft used when he was talking about Cthulhu, right? Used as a callback. That's the town. That's where all the things started. And, and we forget that, right? We forget that because we think Batman. And so the first thing I want to poke a hole in is this line that every single security blog starts with, every white paper starts with, every webinar starts with, and 9 out of 10 vendor talks will tell you. Security is constantly changing, and everything you guys know is wrong, right? How many times do we hear that? It's always changing. There's no way to keep up. Okay, fine. It's, it's always changing. I get that, right? But what a hard place to be in. And does it really always change? There's this, uh, there's this grid that organizations usually use when they're trying to do strategic analysis, right? What We want to launch new products. So where in this grid is it? Is it a new market need? Is it a new solution, or is it something we already have, but we want to fit it somewhere else? And it's this entire innovation cycle. If you stop for a minute and you pause for a minute and think about this for criminals, right? Cyber criminals, big business. Cyber criminals, diversification. Cyber criminals, what are they doing? Well, we got to come up with a new way of hacking you guys. And we're now going to go after, you know, the mom and pop gas station store or the automotive manufacturers with phishing attacks. So we'll, we'll launch this. So right now, Every hacker, every criminal hacker, is going through and trying to figure out a new way to make money, right? Following these types of steps. The problem with thinking that everything constantly changes is we're like, yes, everything changes. So we're winning right in this square. It's a new solution. We will focus on it. We'll learn it. We'll get really good at what's going on, right? And so new news comes out, like crack. Um, are, we, are we vulnerable to crack? How many people already patched? All right, how many people don't know what crack is yet? Oh, cool. All right, I'm talking to you for the next few minutes. All right, so crack happens, right? It's this new attack on, on Wi-Fi. It has to do with WPA. WPA, when you link up, it, it does a, a four-way handshake. And in that handshake, if you send bad stuff during that handshake, the wireless goes, I don't know what you're doing, bro. But here's the nonce again. And if you got the nonce, you got two of them, you can compare, and then you can start eavesdropping traffic, right? You can start attacking things. So crack happens. Far left quadrant, right? We're all like, oh, crack's going on. And there's emails going on, and people are talking about it, and it's, it's vendors, and I'm in my car on YouTube. I'm like, we are vulnerable to crack. You should do something. At the same time, at the same time, attackers are like, look, we're still using the same old solutions that had everybody, no problem. Um, maybe we'll just send a bunch of phishing emails again. That always seems to work, right? <laughs> We've got this entire sector that we're just completely ignoring. Do you guys know what else happened the same day that crack hit? All right? Adobe. 
Did you see this new Adobe uh, Flash phone? Same day. How many people got hit by crack in the real world? Anyone? Probably not. It's really cool. Hats off to those investigators or uh, the researchers who came up with that. This everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Everyone's going at it, right? And and we don't think about that. We're so attached to the new things because we're constantly everything's constantly changing. Everything's constantly changing. Everything's constantly changing. But but 20 years of security means there's a lot of stuff out there, right? We need historians. We need the folks who can look back and go, you know what? Yeah, everything's changing, but with crack, when we had WEP and everything was clear text, we just VPN'd. Or um, we're still running WEP and we just have physical security around it, right? We need the historians that can go, what is old and still working? What's still the vectors that criminals are using? Oh, that phishing email, that's great. How are they now using that same thing to get into somewhere else? How are they now using email rules, right? Which email rules have been around forever and a day to get in somewhere else and to make a new dime. We need historians who can look back at that. And I get concerned every time we're like, it's constantly changing, that we're, we're missing out on this story, right? We're missing out um, on calling back to Arkham. So that's the first one that bugs me a lot. The other one that bugs me has to do with Paris and rhinos. And uh, if you guys are new to any of my talks, you're probably going, why are we talking about Arkham and Paris and, I'm sorry, but welcome to Gurkhan. Um, in Paris, there's a zoo. And in Paris and in that zoo, they had rhinos. And if I was in Paris, I would go visit the zoo and I think that would be great. And then I'd drink plenty of wine and I'd go to the Eiffel Tower and have great sightseeing. I would not think, oh, this is a great idea. Let's poach some rhinos. However, some criminals did. And when I heard in the news that these criminals had killed two rhinos at this wildlife park in Paris, I'm like, well, why would you do that? What's going on? What, isn't that like a third world country thing? Isn't that like something that happens somewhere where there's nothing to see? Like, couldn't you go to the Louvre? I mean, what were you thinking? And so I started doing the math. The rhino horn uh, is ounce for ounce worth more than gold. Did you guys know this? I had no idea. Um, the rhino horns that they had stolen were worth a quarter million dollars a piece. Quarter million dollars a piece, right? That they had poached. Half million dollars in, in damages or on the open market. So you think about that. If you had just given a whole ton of money, right, to the zoo and said, here is five million dollars, or no, here's a half million dollars in gold. You think they would have just put it like, hey, everyone can see it. It's right here. Check it out, right? You think they would have just had like fences about yay high? No, they probably would have secured it completely differently. However, they didn't think about that. They thought about it from the perspective of this is zoo, this is an animal, this is what we're trying to protect. So the next thing I hear all the time is we need to manage risk, right? In information security, we need to manage risk. And we've had some great talks about risk management, and it's pointed out the pros and cons. But the challenge with managing risk is it can lead to thinking about, here's my risk register, here's everything I need to worry about, or being very, very focused on what's internal, right? And we miss some of the bigger picture. So for example, if we're playing risk, we should play risk. I try and play like three games of risk a day, fun fact. Keeps me smart, I think. It doesn't really, it's a great waste of time. So here's a traditional risk map, right? And so we've got some bad guys over here that are trying to do something. We've got some bad guys over here, and, and something is happening over here, right? And the way risk works, it's whoever has the more pieces, you get to roll longer. Anyways, point is, we've got defenses here, here, and here, and there's some defenses up there, and you're like, wow, that's great. And then if Kelvin was in the room, he'd go, yeah, that's perimeter defense, bro. I'm going to just, but work with me, right? So we've got some good defenses. Oftentimes when we're building our defenses, we are thinking about our business. We're thinking about what zones do we have? What is our uh, organization trying to do, right? Maybe this is our payment zone and maybe we've got like business users over here and we'll stick the guest Wi-Fi in Britain. Um, that's what we think, right? That's what, that's, this is the world we live and breathe in. However, the criminals aren't playing by that board and that's where we get in trouble. If you take those exact same pieces and put it on a different board, now we've got wide open spaces, right? Exact same pieces, wide open spaces where all the resources are. 
this is fundamentally where we fall down, right? We're playing two games simultaneously. It's the rhino story all over again because we think it's a rhino, so we protect it with a shorter fence, and then the criminals go, ha, half a million dollars in gold. What can we do about that, right? A, how does it happen? B, what can we do about it? A, how does it happen? Because that's what we're thinking about and we're focusing on risk. B, what we can do about it is turn the map. Turn the map a little bit. Let's suppose we had a payment system, okay? And that payment system had, um, I don't know, give me a record, a, a million records. And we know records today are worth $10. So we go, okay, that's, that system, this part of the map is now worth $10 million to our adversary. This part over here has some health records, not as many. There's maybe a thousand, but those are worth $60 a record. So there's $60,000 over there, right? We go to the dark web and say, oh, what is this data selling for? And we do that math by the records. Now you say, well, wait, well, there's systems that don't have any data on it. Okay, good, good. So that's probably a little bit lower. We don't necessarily have to spend so much time on it. But what would it be to an attacker from a denial of service perspective? Or from a, um, you know, Bitcoining mining perspective, right? These types of things that they would do for commodity hardware. We can still get that pricing out. Researchers do it. The research has been done. We pull it down, throw in a calculator. Now we've got a map, a map of our business, but not from our business's perspective, a map from the criminal's perspective. That makes sense? And I think we need to start thinking about a little bit more like that because then we can start building better defenses. Maybe we don't need all our stuff over here. Maybe we can allow Great Britain to fall. Sorry, Great Britain, but you're the guest Wi-Fi, so what do you do? But maybe we can, right? Maybe we can make some good decisions based on that about where we want to prioritize and where we want to act. All right, next one, healthcare. So, did you guys hear about the C-section? The woman who got C well, everyone's like, yes, I've heard about someone getting a C-section. Let me back up. Uh, yay, Gurkhan. So, this woman gets a C-section, goes in for an operation, right? Seems to go flawlessly, seems to go well. But after a couple days, she starts feeling some, some pain, some tingling. So she goes back in. She goes, I, I don't think I feel right. It, at, at different intervals, it like tingles. It, it, it feels weird. And they, they talk to her and they you know, do something. Like, You've got no problems. Go home. Okay. Another couple days happens. And it happens a couple more times. Back in the doctor. So the doctor's like, yeah, is this psychosomatic? Are you, you know, sometimes there's postpartum and you may be experiencing. So they're not taking her seriously at all, right? And so she goes home, and it, it happens a few more times. So she goes back into a third time, stands her ground, says, look, you need to check into this. You need to figure out what's going on. So they x-ray her. They x-ray her, right? They found a cell phone. The doctor left a cell phone in her. And so this was people, like, calling the cell phone, going, hey, you know. Thank goodness it wasn't, like, on Twitter. It would have been, like, constant vibrate. But these types of mistakes happen all the time. So in the, in the healthcare field, much like in the hacker field, you've got very, very smart people with very, very strong opinions, and let's just put it nicely, reasonably sized egos. Have you guys caught the talk that I did with Stephanie about uh, playing doctor? We actually compared the medical field and the hacker field, because there's so much we can learn there in terms of uh, patient care and having conversations and getting the patient to do stuff, like much like we're trying to always get our users to do stuff. There's an entire world around that that you can explore. But the point I want to make right now is they're actually putting in pre-flight checklists, right? Checklists to have the doctor follow. Now, we all hate checklists, but it's a 90-second checklist. In one study, not related to this uh, surgery, but a hospital put in place a simple 90-second checklist, and it reduced mortality by 18%, right? One in five people would died because they didn't want to follow a checklist. It had to get to that level before they're like, huh, checklist isn't bad. But, but how many times have we been sitting around going, we should do risk management, but by God, I hate checkbox security. Damn checkbox security. This should be more than just a checking the box exercise. Wolf, we really need to, yeah, but okay, but is it Great Britain in the wireless again? Do we really care as attackers coming after it? I don't know. And I think, I think if we stop and we look at the money that criminals could make off various parts of our networks, there's probably a lot of it where we could just check the box. We're doing stuff there. It's okay. You know what I mean? I think we should get to the point where we're like, you know what? Checking the box, not too bad of an idea. 
And if you look at a lot of these standards, one of the areas that I, I'm very pro on, and a lot of people disagree, is like PCI. PCI is great. We're going to tell them you got to put in firewalls and do vulnerability management. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's checking the box. I got in this argument with a guy on Twitter. Surprising, it's Twitter. But my phone's not in any one woman, so it's OK. And, and he's like, I can't stand PCI because checkbox security. I'm like, well, what's it missing? He goes, well, it's missing vulnerability management. I'm like, that's requirement like seven. Oh, yeah, but, but you know, real attackers don't think like PCI. Well, OK, we've got a requirement for pen testing and getting real attackers in. But you don't understand, Wolf. It's a checkbox. I'm like, you're absolutely right. It's a checkbox. <laughs> Silly me. So maybe we need to start thinking about, hey, what if we just to check the box across the board? And when we check the box across the board, right, we've got the game. We're going to check it here. 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 Maybe we start watching, right? We're noticing the activity over here. Nothing over here. We'll keep this checked, but maybe we should act a little bit more over there, right? Maybe we should tighten that control up. Maybe instead of just checking the box, we should do periodic auditing. Maybe instead of doing periodic auditing, we should do continuous auditing. Maybe we should look for implementing that control in an automated vulnerability scanner or configuration management system. So if anyone changes it, we know right away, right? Looking at how the criminals are actually using this grid and where the heat maps are and then acting out of that. Does that make sense? Strengthening where it really matters. Now, a lot of people also tell you, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. If we're secure, we're compliant. Yeah. Uh, people who work out, who hits the gym on a regular basis? All right. Uh, do you guys skip leg day? Never skip leg day. Whenever I hear someone say, but I'm secure, so I must be compliant, I always think about them. I'm like, yeah, but I bench press, so my legs, yeah. It doesn't work that way, right? These are different exercises. If we're secure, we're doing some great stuff. We're doing things like, hey, hardware and software inventory. We know what's on our board. That in and of itself is, is a, a monumental feat. Uh, we're doing standards, right? Maybe we're lying to the CIS, and we're knowing when stuff changes. Uh, maybe we've, we've pulled down the best practices guide from Amazon because we're in the cloud, and we have heard that S3 got breached. Well, it didn't get breached, but data in S3 keeps getting leaked via, I was at Verizon. Um, who else was the recent one? Oh, it was the cloud company. The cloud company was doing encryption. They put it in S3. Awesome. They did not use the checklist for S3. OK, maybe not a good idea. And then they went, oh, we'll put our key management here, and we'll store our customers' private keys here, and it will also store our customers' data here, and it was a clear text S3 bucket. Oof. Also, the company touts itself as a cloud enablement company, so I was kind of one. But anyways, so we got some standards, right? And then we're doing vulnerability and patch management, and we're monitoring. Would you guys all agree, if we just did these four things, most orgs would be very secure? Yeah, that's a, that's a good recipe for being secure. However, if you think about everything that goes into compliance, it's usually stuff we don't want to do, like governance, um, vendor risk management, physical security. So oftentimes, cybersecurity and physical security are here today, right? Lock, pick, booth, we go out, we do all this sort of stuff. But in orgs, it's usually two completely different teams. Same thing with vendor risk. The CISO is responsible for security, purchasing does vendor risk. Software development obviously usually falls on the dev team. These are just a couple examples of, hey, we need to be compliant. And these are all activities to be compliant that are not going to be thought of if we're just thinking about security. Make sense? And again, remember, too, we're playing those two different games at the same time, right? I really miss my clicker. <laughs> out of caffeine and out of batteries. All right. With the protecting of what we're doing on a regular basis, and preventing the criminals from getting in. So if you think about that in terms of compliance, protect's right there, right? Have a compliance arm. That goes into protecting the business. That goes into making sure you're doing regulations. That goes into making sure that you're aligned with um, whatever the customer demands are, right? Customer says you got to be this tall to ride the ride. You're that tall to ride the ride. But that's different activity, fundamentally, than prevention, right? Securing against what the criminals do. And they're related, sure, but I think too often times we go, if you're scared, you're compliant, don't worry about it. And the people are like, well, okay. And then where do, you, where do you go from there, right? Once you get secure and someone goes, you're not compliant. Well, wait, yes, I am. I'm fully patched. That's awesome. Good for you. What are you doing for vendor risk management? Well, it's not my problem. 
So the other thing is um, patching. Patching in food. You guys, you guys may not have. Last year I did a talk over lunch. We're going to bring back a little bit of this, uh, the work we did then. We looked at several different food manufacturing companies. And since then we've expanded that out, uh, looking at the food distribution that gets to your table and looking back at, at the grain and whatnot. Some interesting stuff. But one of the number one things we always find when we walk into these places is it's very, very old technology. Very old. I mean, like the food industry is the number one purveyor of zero cables. I mean, just old stuff. I had a great conversation with a guy who still runs DOS. I'm like, do you need to like do, you know, MSYS? He's like, yeah, I do high MSYS. I'm like, oh, that's great. Old stuff. And so when you actually looked at it, it was something around 40% of them were 16 years older, 40% of them were 11 to 15. I mean, really old stuff. And because of that, a lot of the um, vendors, you know, you buy this big piece of equipment, buy a computer that sticks on it, you got someone who goes and puts the software. A lot of the vendors who make that software have gone away, right? Or don't even support anything past DOS or Windows. Really, really brittle. And of course, there's vulnerabilities all over it. There's clear text passwords, there's remote code execution, you can update it on authorized ways, which is kind of great. We can't patch, but we can unauthorized patch. That'd be fun. And the types of vulnerabilities break out something like this, right? A lot of product manipulation, a lot of clear text. One in 10, you can knock over with a denial of service. A lot of stuff. Now, you go into that and you're like, ha ha, it's okay. I saw the bumper sticker. I know what to do. Got to patch all the things, right? That's what they say. If we could just patch all the things. And uh, when we do these projects, a lot of times we have analysts who come right out of college or have been to these conferences who's heard someone say, you know, just patch all the things. And they're like, we just need to patch all the things. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yes, we do. But A, there's no patches. B, if you do that patch, things are going to break. And C, what's more impactful to them, what you're trying to protect, all right? Breaking the manufacturing line and stopping food or running it in a vulnerable way and taking the risk that someone might get in. You know, it's always balancing those things. And we can't always patch all the things. So oftentimes in the, in the manufacturing industry, we'll go into these meetings and the plant manager is right there. He's like, don't you even try telling me to patch. I'm like, patch? Why would you patch? What are you going to patch? I'm not. I go, I know. He goes, but you guys always tell me that. I go, I'm not going to say that. He goes, well, what about patch other things? I'm like, no. He's like, good. What are we going to do? I'm like, networking. Segmenting? Yes. Isolating these things. Now, granted, can you still jump over the fence, go around? Sure. But again, thinking about what we can realistically do, putting in those mitigating controls, so friggin' important. We saw that with Equifax. Now, I'm not letting Equifax off the hook. That was a debacle. It's a whole other story for a whole other day. Uh, right up to and including, they had websites with admin, admin all over the place. Terrible. But when that happened, everyone got really interested in struts, right? So struts, the, the Equifax breach was caused by struts, which is packaged with an Apache, specifically with struts. It was the Jakarta image manipulator. So you could use that piece of code to upload a web shell and get out. When Equifax was finally realized they were popped and they went to look at it, they were popped something like 30 times over. There's 30 different web shells are installed. And one of these attackers was really, really clever. He logged in, typed, who am I? And then never connected again. We know those were the real ones. The script kiddies who can do who am I. So, point being, with Equifax, struts was there, struts with the vulnerability. Now that happened, everyone's like, just patch, just patch, patch all the things. The issue with struts is struts is MVC, model view controller. So organizations who have heavily rely on that, written Java code, right, built these applications, these applications that run their business, are doing all the processing for whatever, right, have the website up so we can go buy tickets to conferences, whatever it may be, those websites heavily, heavily rely on struts. You patch struts, you've now broke their code. And they're not very happy with you, right? Now, we can't just say, um, oh, well, right? Eventually, we do need a patch. And there's processes in place where developers will try with the new environment. Now, with DevOps, it's even easier. And there's an entire line of discussion about how you can get that code updated and refactored out to the environment quicker. But it still takes time. It takes time. It takes testing. It takes talent. It takes investment. And yet we say patch all the things. We patch all the things we break. Now what are we left to protect? But I think the reason is saying, 
They're like, mitigate some of the things. Just doesn't sound snazzy. I think that'd be a great bumper sticker though, right? Some of the things that we can. Okay. All right, but talking about patching, here's another one that, that drives me nuts, uh, especially with developers, right? We can't patch stupid. You guys hear this all the time? We can't patch stupid. Well, I love the hubris. <laughs> I feel real smart. You guys all feel smart. We're in this conference like, yeah, brain power. But again, I, I came out of medical and I came out of financial services before I got into consulting. I was around some really smart doctors. I was around some really smart financial whizzes on the trading floor. Um, I remember once, uh, I, was, I was sharing this story with Joel Cardella after his talk, that I went to our CFO, I reported up to that, and I'm like, we need to do risk management. He's like, Wolf, what are you talking about? I have an entire floor of PhDs who do risk management. I need you to patch things. I'm like, yes, but not all the things. I mean, it, it's, I've seen tons of smart people, and I think if you think about your we got some brilliant folks who are out there. But it's just so easy to go, oh, you can't patch stupid. So A, I think we need to dial that back. But B, B, fun fact, you can patch stupid. There's been lots of ways to do it. One of them was uh, this food company out in uh, the UK. And what they did is they used the IT crowd. They had like a spoof of the IT crowd. And they had two-minute videos that went out every month. They had a production company, two-minute videos went out every month that tackled a different aspect of their firm. Now, what they were having problems with was um, that people were sneaking into these restricted areas, right? There's, it's a restaurant, so people are getting back and stealing food, let's be honest. And there was also issues where, because it was more of an open culture, they had the IT out, and the IT was also not properly physically secured. So they're trying to tackle this issue, trying to build a culture of security. And through funny videos, a couple minutes uh, uh, a month, over the course of two years, they actually trended those problems down. The users got more aware of it. The employees got more aware of it. People would walk in. They go, hey, I don't know you. Are you supposed to be here? They started escorting people out. All the things we'd want from a really smart user. It just took a way of being funny, meeting them where they were at, and having a good message and repeating that message over. Really cool case study. It ties back to the, my other favorite one. This is the one that actually made me want to do this talk. We never hear this one. Now I'm old, and I don't have a necessarily the best memory, but correct me if I'm wrong, didn't we build this whole internet and web thing so we could click shit? Wasn't, wasn't, wasn't that the idea? And, and those of you who have a little gray, do you remember when we first got HTML email and we thought this was the best thing ever because we could bold and italicize and put in images? It was awesome. Now click shit. Now there's some great, great ways to do this too. Um, phishing programs. Historically, don't work well, as we know, because you do them once a year, or you do them ad hoc, or you try to decrease the amount of clicking. Now, if we were to turn that in the head, what if instead of our goal for phishing was to not get people to click stuff, right? You're still going to have 60%. But what if you were to say, our goal is to get the one or two people who are, who are quick, one or two people who recognize it, to report it? And furthermore, our goal is with the IT guys, to take that report, triage, and very quickly black hole it. Black hole the IP address, black hole the, the uh, domain name, maybe even de delete the email out of the email system altogether if it's a bulk one, right? So now we've, we've sent spam to, or a phishing attack to 1,000 users, and 60% of them have clicked on the link because those are the stats we see at my firm all the time, but 40% haven't, and better yet, maybe 2 or 3% have notified us, and the help desk has taken care of it. Wouldn't there be a better metric to do? I've seen a couple organizations that do this. One was a healthcare company, and when they did that, they got so good that they were up to a three-minute response. They brought in Dave Kennedy's group, um, and Dave Kennedy's group did a phishing exercise, and within three minutes, a C-level executive reported it. I can't get a C-level executive usually to answer an email in three days. But three minutes, he reports it, 16 minutes, IT blocked it and removed it from the inboxes. 16 freaking minutes. And now, everyone else who clicks that, there's nowhere to go, right? Such a cool idea. Imagine if we were to go back to the 1950s and talk to automotive manufacturers, 
right, and say, you know what, you can't patch stupid. And they go, I know. And you, you shouldn't click shit. And they're like, absolutely. And then they're like, so we're going to build our cars with manual brakes and manual transmissions. And they're like, that's a good idea. Forget the seatbelt. That's on, that's on them, right? But that's what we do. In the, in the driving world, we've got all these sensors and everything to protect us. We can build the same thing, I would argue, in the fishing world for users. So getting back to a more of a fun story, Eskimos. All right, um, a lot of you guys probably already heard this story, right? Franz Boas, Franz Boas was this explorer. He went out and hung out with the Inuit. It was in northern Canada. Um, so he went out and spent lots of time with them and documented, lived their ways, found out uh, what, their, what made them tick. And one of the things that he reported back in his book, it's like 1911, he published a book on this. 1911, he's like, you know what's really cool about the Eskimos? Is the way they think about snow. Have you guys heard about the story? They got like a million and one words of snow. 53 words to describe snow. An Eskimo can talk to another Eskimo, and with one word can indicate, is it wet snow or dry snow? Is it snow that we can uh, make into a house, or is it snow that we can ride our sled on? Is it snow that's good for hunting, or is it snow that we really need to be cautious of and stay in? 53 different words for snow. 53 different words. It's an amazing dialect, and it's an amazing story of this guy who went out and lived it in a time where you had like nothing but what you had in your back, right? And he even wrote back to his wife at the time. He's like, I truly feel like an Eskimo. Should say Inuit, but hey, come on, friends didn't know any better. But he's like, I am living entirely on seal meat. It was like this big macho letter. Like, that is such a, such a badass guy. And then I felt bad for him because Eskimos don't have a single word for pizza. And that sounds like a terrible way to live. But a cool story, wouldn't you guys agree? 53 words for snow. Now pause that for just a minute. Let's keep talking about pizza. Did you guys hear about Pizza Hut? Pizza Hut got popped, all right? About a week ago, maybe two weeks ago now. Pizza Hut got popped. Now what happened was they, um, they've got a mobile app. They've got their web app. This mobile and web app talks back to a set of web APIs, right? Traditional N-tier architecture for web design. This mobile app and web app talk to these APIs. These APIs do tokenization and protection of the data. Once it's those APIs and the order starts processing, it's a token. You no longer have a payment card, right? That's the, that's the beauty of tokenization. A token gets passed along the way to the merchant bank who's like, yeah, go ahead, get your order. The API goes, great, you can have it. Goes back to the mobile app, says you get your pizza now. Everything's good. That's the way this stuff works. In the old days, before tokens, you would have this big database full of credit card information. We guys have probably all heard every single breach story ever where they're like, we popped store X and we got 50 billion credit cards because they had the whole database. Now it's all tokens. Very, very cool. But what that means is criminals have to move, right? If, if you dam the water, the water doesn't go, ah, huh, I'm good. The water goes around. Same thing happened with this particular breach. This happens, the criminals go to the API. They pop that API. We do not know how, that technical detail is not released. I suspect command injection, whole other story. They pop that API, they pop that API, and then they're reading traffic off of it. And as you're swiping your card, traffic is you know, encrypted here, gets the API, it's decrypted, it's CPS, TLS, and right before it goes to token, hacker picked it up out of memory. Dead in memory, decrypted, they stored it in a the file, they exfiltrated it. Ouch, that sucks. That's like worst case scenario, right? Terrible. And this was the headline. Pizza Hut suffers security breach, waits two weeks to tell people. Yeah, Pizza Hut, you suck, right? That was the headline I saw, and people were all like piling on. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna propose a slightly different headline to you guys. This, would, this is my proposal, and this is probably about as good as mitigate some of the things, but work with me. Pizza Hut identifies, contains, and eradicates attackers in 28 hours. The attack I just told you should not have happened, right? That should not, that's probably not within their, their um, threat model. Very improbable attack. Usually, you know, everything's encrypted, should be fine. In instant response, the mean time to detect a threat is what? To about 200 days right now? The mean time to get them off your network is another 100 hours, 100 days? Up to 300 days is what a lot of these breaches are going. 
Pizza Hut identified it, contained it, figured out what was happening, saw it in their logs, went into IR mode, did a deep dive investigation, got those guys off their network, figured out exactly what was lost. That's important because so oftentimes we got like, were we breached or not? That's what the question we already are asked. The other very important question a lot of people forget is, were we breached or not? And the quantity of dead data, right? What was actually lost? Another thing very hard to detect. Qualifying, quantifying, and a breach. But they did all that, knew how much was lost, and developed a response and communicated that out within two weeks. Probably had to go through the PR team, a whole bunch of other things. I'm sure a couple people got false charges on their credit cards during that time. Maybe that two weeks could have been shortened up. But 28 hours, isn't that awesome? Who can do that? Very, very few people. Very few people can say, I'm go, I could totally detect an attacker in 28 hours. Ugh. So hard to do. Problem is that we really, even though Intuits have 53 words for snow, we only have one word for breach. If you go up to privacy rights, data breaches, uh, which is great if you're looking at threat modeling or looking at what kind of breaches occur and trying to design a security program. If you go up to that site, you will see everything from Equifax to someone reported their phone stolen. One word for breach. It's always that same thing, right? And that can really get in our way when we're trying to go ahead and design a security program or a response or communicate. I would love to have been as an industry, wow, Pizza Hut kicks some major tail. Can we, can we hear the success? How do they do that? What can we learn from them? They're not going to tell us because we just beat the hell out of them and told them they sucked, right? There's, there's no way they're going to share that. Now, the answer to that, of course, is well, with all these things, what you need, Wolf, is defense and depth. Always defense and depth. And again, good reason for this. Just like don't click stuff, can't patch people. There's good reasons for all these things, but taken to their extreme and as a bumper sticker it cause a lot of problems. If you think about defense and depth, something like this, right? We have equally defended all of our map with three pieces. We are good, that is defense and depth. Um, the board says, are we secure? We can testify that we are spending a lot equally, right? We've got depth. And so oftentimes, it's great when you talk to the CISOs who have that model, because they will immediately, do you have defense and depth? Absolutely. I've got this tool, that tool, this other tool. I've got everything in the Gartner Magic Quadrant, and I've got two sims. Yes. That's a horrible idea. Just from a game of risk perspective, anyone likes to play risk, I will give you this tip. Uh, if you move your pieces, right, to where the attackers are going to come, you're in a much better spot. But we don't oftentimes know where the tech is going to come, right? We don't know, so we determine that we'll just put the defenses everywhere. We'll have defense in depth, which is when that turns into expense in depth, right? And then penetration testers come and go, oh, that's cute, but we're just going to navigate over here and over there, and you're still going to lose. It's all about focusing on where the priorities are. So where are the priorities? And how do we get there? Building castles, of course. Back in, back in France, there's this castle called Gillian Castle. They started building in 1997. It's really freaking cool. What they basically did was they went to a whole bunch of historians, artisans, craftsmen, right? And they said, how did they used to mill stone in the Middle Ages? How they used to cut timber in the Middle Ages? What were the wheels and the mechanics for building castles in the Middle Ages? And they came together and they launched this project to build a castle. And they're building castle with all the quintessential classic techniques. They figure it's going to be done in maybe another five years. Right now it's open for tourism. There's no rhinos, so you're good there. And it's, it costs about $10 million. I really like this because we always hear secure it like a castle. And we love our castles, right? Every single book has a castle diagram. Here's how to protect like a castle. Here's how to secure like a fortified castle. Here's a reference for castles so we can talk about web security. That comes from a wasp, I'm sorry. Here is our firewalls and our intranets. And doesn't that look just like a castle? Yes, awesome. Have you ever guys thought about how terrible an analogy a castle really is? If you just do the math, this is uh, Harlock Castle in Wales. It's like the quintessential castle, all right? And there's not many castles left. Before I even get to that, I should mention there are very few castles around. Part of it is age, but part of it is 
Castles had a failure rate on par with most IT projects. <laughs> they would start to build and build and then be like, a new guy comes in, right? Or they'd build half the castle and the siege would come and knock it all over. Or they'd run out of money. Or the specs would change. Or scope creep, right? It's terrible. It's really terrible. But they finished Harlock Castle, so we can look at that and it's like the quintessential model. All right. How much did it cost? It cost 10% of the revenue of the kingdom for about 25 years to build this castle, 10%. According to Gartner, today, we spend about 0.2% on IT security and 0.32% on IT in terms of revenue, right? Can you imagine going to your board and going, ah, you know, money is good, we got like 100 million in revenue, right? Am I right? This is fantastic. I was learning about castles. I need to ask you, I need about 1 million. Just one million every year, right? No, they'd be like, yeah, you're funny. Get out of here, right? It wouldn't happen. The other thing, too, is on staffing-wise, right? We think about nights. Uh, security pros are way outgunned. There's about one InfoSec pro per 1,000 employees in most firms. For every 20 IT guys, you have maybe one InfoSec person. Those, these are the averages. And so if you think about a castle and you think about the round table and think about nights, it's a really bad metaphor because we don't have the resources. We don't have the people, and if we really took 25 years to build it, we'd be great for manufacturing and food services. 40 years old, right? We'd be bad for everything else. It's not a good model. I think a better model is bells, right? Security is not castle building. It's not about high walls or strong doors. Security is bells on strings that ring every time an attacker moves. A great idea. What if we had a pen tester and we had enough sensors that we knew when he was moving through our environment and we could respond? The 28-hour turnaround, get it down to two hours or less. And what if we could really mess with them? Like, not let them know there's bells, or slow them down other ways. Maybe throw in some obscurity. And I know you guys are going, wait, wait, that sounds like security through obscurity. Don't do that. Because that's the other one we always hear about. Uh, and I was having some conversations about this as I'm putting together a slide deck. And, and I was talking to Colleen, who I'm giving a shout out. Hi, Colleen. Thank you. And one of the things that she's like, well, what would you do about SSH TCP? Like, what do you mean what I do about SSH? So what if you want to SSH in? Security through obscurity, right? You won't want to move that port. Well, why not? Because then you're doing security through obscurity, and that's a weakness. However, if I design networks, and please don't scan my stuff because I do this, uh, I would move it to a higher port. I move all my stuff to different ports, right? Because think about ringing those bells. Pen testers, where are they hiding? They're hiding the noise. You put something on a public internet with TCP 22, and how much... Uh, noise you're going to get? Lots. Because you're going to be scanned again and again and again and again. You move that to 222, two, two, how much noise are you going to get? It's going to be someone drawing an Nmap scan on you, right? It's probably one of you guys checking my web server right now. It's not going to happen very often. And then when you have a security operations team, there's not so much noise to, for them to hide in. We used to do this all the time uh, with my SIM program. We had files that no one should touch. We had ports that no one should touch. We had... Um, what else we have? We had like WAN uh, boundaries and IP address ranges that no one should ever get to that would only trigger off when pen testers came into the room. And then pen testers would come in, they'd be all bold, and they'd go, and we'd be like, ah, gotcha. How'd you do that? I don't know. Not with castles, bells. Bells every single day. So when you start thinking about defense and depth, right, and we forget about defense and depth, we start moving more to the model of, like, castles, balloon castle defense where the attacker is going to take their path through the network, and we just have to have enough points in time where we can see them respond, react, and play. We build a big castle, they're going to go way around it every single time. So with that, we've got about five more minutes I'm going to wrap up. And the point of all this is, the point of all this is, and I'm stealing Kelvin's quote because I thought it was a great quote, Defenders make assumptions. Hacking is about exploiting those assumptions, right? That was Kelvin Spartan talk before me. Hackers are all about exploiting those assumptions. Unfortunately, we have gotten into, as an industry, the habit of making our own assumptions and making these assumptions such that we repeat them on conferences, we put them on stickers. We literally have bumper stickers for some of the things I put up here. We put them on stickers and, and we tell college kids Patch all the things, don't click stuff, don't do security through obscurity, do defense in depth, 
all the way through. And I get it. I totally get it. We don't have enough people. I just said, we don't have enough people, right? We can't have nights. So I understand what we're trying to do, and I understand being on, on the board with uh, universities, the, the tremendous pressure it is to educate folks. I completely get that. But the risk we're running here as an industry is we continue to mature, and now we have degrees in, in computer science, and we complain about people with music degrees. As we mature as an industry, we're really running the risk of codifying these things without thinking about the obverse, right? Of saying this is the way it is, and this is the way it's always been done, so therefore this is the way that security must be done. So junior people come up with a whole bunch of platitudes and, and ways that they think things should be done, and they smack right into reality uh, when they start uh, hitting on the world. And then senior folks, because it's the way it's always been, that's the way we think about things, right? What's our strategy? Uh, what is Gartner saying? What's our defense in depth? Here's my budget. Um, why don't we move these things around and make it a little bit trickier? That's security through obscurity. Okay, what about uh, if we were to do governance? Well, that's checkbox security. What are, you, what are you doing to me? We need to have a better, all right, um, hmm. And what ends up happening is the senior folks get stuck in an area where it's very hard to innovate. It's very hard to get to those areas where most attackers are, which is reusing old techniques against us in old ways. The cyber war will not be won with platitudes. All right? Yeah, I know, cyber war. I didn't do that, though. But it won't. We have, to, we have to get out and start thinking about things. We have to question. We have to argue. We have to hack. We have to make our own way. We have to push back on these platitudes. We have to push back on these folks who are saying it has to be this way and go, what about the opposite? All right? We heard about this breach. It was bad. What if it was good? What's the good in it? We heard about this way of securing things. Have you tried the exact opposite? We have to. We have to shred the box if we're really going to be successful. I'll leave you with one other one that I hear all the time that drives me nuts. We have to be right every time. The bad guys only need to be right once. It's my favorite quote on a chalkboard when you go into a bar. Much like the guy eating seal, it sounds really badass. Here's the thing about that. That is true if you do not have multiple points, if you don't have those bells, right? If we don't know all the space, and we're only thinking about in terms of protection, not in terms of prevention, and we don't have a clear line of sight of the path the criminal is going to take, and we don't have detective points, absolutely, sure, yeah, yeah, that's going to happen. However, and I've seen in a number of different organizations, and I would argue that um, uh, our friends at Pizza Hut prove this, if we have multiple detection points, say we have six different uh, paths that they need to pass, six different detective points, right? Maybe it's AV, maybe it's a firewall, Maybe it's your IPS, maybe we got SIM, maybe we got some obscurity through some, uh, you know, um, deceptive technologies. Maybe we've got in-depth logging here and here, and this other token that should never, never, ever, ever be touched. And then we got DLP whenever that token goes out to alert us, right? So we have six different points. Do you know how really good an attacker would have to be to move past all those six points? Really, really good. They're not going to be able to do it. We're going to catch them, we're going to stop them. But the problem is, is that we go, oh, we don't have those points, right? But doing some threat modeling, doing some analysis of it is going to allow us to build those things, put the bells in place, and secure it down. And I think that's absolutely positively what we have to do. We've got to move beyond the platitudes to implementing these things so we can catch the folks and uh, recover quickly. And that, in my opinion, is what we're getting wrong. So before I step off stage, anyone have questions? We've got a few minutes. Going once, going twice, yeah. The best bell options. Um, right now, uh, hmm? Okay, right now, I, I really like tokens, like honey tokens, uh, because pass the hash and everything is, is one of the first tricks that uh, criminals do. Now we're seeing with Mimi Cats being used in Petcha and Bad Rabbit and insert cool name here for the next attack. Right? They're doing that all the time, so I like that. Um, I like uh, good SIM with monitoring on multiple points. We caught an insider threat a while back because we had monitoring for people logging into disabled accounts. It's one of the CSC controls. Uh, no one ever does that, but the person had left and was still connected by the VPN because the help desk process had broke and spent two days trying to get into stuff, and we caught them based on that alert. Right. 
So I like those types of things, good SIMs. Um, what else? Good firewalls. Everyone's going to say, well, perimeter doesn't work. But yeah, you're still moving past the perimeter in and out. So there's still touch points where attackers are going to mess up and mistake. Those are some of my favorites at the moment. Um, anything else? Yeah. So, like denial of service? Yeah. Yeah, so, so denials are still a problem, right? Um, there's different ways to look at how motivated attacker would be. This discussion, this uh, description, is really truly based on the financially motivated attacker, which is the most likely attack and most prevalent attack right now, next to the low-level like automated stuff. So you're absolutely right. You need to, uh, in that particular case, look at that segmentation, make sure the segmentation is tight enough and that you're blocking it so that no one can get in. And, and then test, have a pen tester test it. All right, people are leaving, people are coming in. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>